Welcome back, shalligators. Today, this ain't Texas, but we're still gonna talk like it is. Damn it. God damn it. Should I do this whole, you know what, script? I'm gonna do this whole video in an accent and I'm gonna try and make it a Texas accent. It's a little bit more of a drawl, you know? Because we're gonna talk about how to break into something new because isn't Beyonce doing exactly that? Beyonce, why does my voice get deeper when I'm talking all Southern? Beyonce, First, it was the British accent talking about Kay Middleton. Now this. Beyonce's fixing to release a country album. Carter Cowboy. No, damn it. What's it called? Cowboy Carter. <laughs> I really like to do my research for these types of videos, right? Beyonce is coming to country music charts. She already is with her new single, Texas Hold'em, which is a good old country song. I think it's a great song. It's playing all over the place here in Montana. I don't know that I can keep that up. I'm sorry. Actually, I know that I can. I don't know that I can get out of it. If I talk like that for the next 30 minutes, brother, I'm there and there's no going back. I'm like Austin Butler with the Elvis accent. So Beyonce has been talking about this upcoming album and what inspired it. And she highlighted an incident at the CMAs, which is the Country Music Awards that happen every June in Nashville. This happened back in 2016 where she performed her song Cuff It on stage with the Dixie Chicks, who have then gone ultra woke and decided they're, oh, Dixie, we can't say that. So they're just the chicks. Go. God, grow a pair. Will some of you people just grow a pair? I, it's just wild to me. Anyway, and so Beyonce said, I did not feel welcomed at that award show, possibly in the whole country music space. And this is kind of her, fuck you. You don't want me here? I'm just gonna be here even more. This is a great thing. Kind of? I don't know. We're going to break it down because I know a lot of you guys message me with questions about wanting to switch it up. Maybe you want to go from married to single. Maybe you want to go from very religious to a little bit more secular. Maybe you want to switch careers. You want to leave the corporate world. You want to become an influencer. Vice versa. We talked in our last video about feminism and I said what feminism means to me is every choice is available to you. There isn't any one path. If you choose to stay home with your kids, you're not not feminist. If that's authentic to you and if you want to go to work, amazing. And so this is kind of an extension of that. Like, the world is always gonna try to box us in as women because we like categories, right? We like labels. I have a label maker right here. It was literally next to me. I got it for Christmas. I would save it in a fire. I'm like a dragon guarding its treasure. I love labels. We as human beings were risk assessors, right? And we wanna be able to look at someone and instantly be able to predict their behavior, right? We see a bitch with a Stanley Cup big dumb cup and we feel like i can maybe predict what i'm gonna get when i talk to this woman might not be a lot of opinions on dostoevsky and quantum particle physics you wrong bitch i'm full of lead now i am particle physics anyway so when we change something in our life even if it's not major if it's our hair, if it's our style. Remember when Billie Eilish did that Vogue cover and she was like literally just wearing different clothes and people were like, ah! Oh. Like, what is the headline here? Adult woman changes her outfit? Are you serious? It's disruptive though. It's disruptive. People literally called Billie like a traitor to her own image and to her fans because she put on a different outfit. What? So doing something as big as what Beyonce is doing and like switching genres is pretty darn disruptive, you know? Honestly, honestly, I think it's gonna be more disruptive for her hardcore fans than for country music fans. We kinda don't care who makes a good country song, you know? Like, the biggest country artist, one of the biggest in the last decade was Darius Rucker. He's black, the Hootie and the Blowfish guy. You know, like, nobody cares. Breland is big, Jimmy Allen, well, he's like, shit the bed, he's like a terrible toxic person, but he was pretty big too, like, it's not, nobody, it's really not that big of a deal. I wonder though, if it's her fans who are gonna be like, you, you've turned on us, you're trying to like appeal to all these redneck MAGA white people. I don't know. I'm, I'm very curious to see how this goes. Cause let's go back to the Billie Eilish example. It was her fans who had the meltdown about her changing outfits. It's like, it wasn't, you know, me like a casual fan. It's like, I really don't live or die by what Billie Eilish wears. I don't, her style is bad. It's quite bad. Um, Pretty bad, but great, like, wear whatever, man. It's, I don't think you're a traitor for literally anything you wear. That's not how I define traitors, it's odd. 
So I'm interested to see how this is gonna go for Beyonce. So we're gonna break it down. How do you radically switch lanes? Because you know who else has done it? Me. I've done it many times, many times over my life. My life is has been several different acts, several different ashes and then a phoenix rising from it. So honey, I get it. I know how to move. I know how to reinvent myself. I know how to make a whole different circle of friends. And I know how to not let the haters get me down. Because when you think about changing, the voice in your head, Crystal, is gonna get louder and louder. So you gotta be forewarned and forearmed and know exactly how to repel that little truck stop lot lizard skank. But before we get started, if you're thinking about making a big change in your life and you feel like you're just not in the right mindset about it, I really encourage you to check out my mindset coach. She's a manifestation guru and teacher, public speaker, just, she's the wind beneath my wings. Laura St. John, I talk about her constantly in the Chalantourage. I parrot back a lot of her advice. She has changed my life. Like since I started working with her in 2021, I am a completely different person. I'm 50 pounds lighter, first of all. I've been able to sustain positive, healthy relationships, better friendships, and I have improved the relationship with myself. I've increased my income and she has courses you can join, they used to be like six weeks only and like once they started, like no more people could join, but now you can drop in and out. So click the link down below. Also, if you live in Zurich or nearby, she is doing an in real life meetup. She's gonna be in Zurich April 6th. I'm gonna be uh, Zooming in on like on Zoom and doing like, I don't know, a 30 minute Q and A or whatever, whatever you guys want, we'll talk about whatever. I promise you though, she's fantastic. At the very least, go and follow her on TikTok and Instagram. She gives really small, bite-sized, actionable ways to change your mindset, to click into that positive vibration. I know that all of this sounds really woo-woo, but you know what? Stuffing yourself to the gills with anxiety medication, that sounds bizarre to me. When you could realign yourself, click into trust, trust that good things are on the way, <sighs> And she makes it easy. And now it's just part of my life. And I know I'm gonna be referencing a lot of her lessons here. So I'll like, you know, like tag her, <laughs> like I'll reference her. I'll cite my sources when I bring it up. But yeah, click down below if you wanna join her courses. I have never directed anyone towards her who isn't like, she changed my life. Not, I have never one time, not one time, heard someone be like, meh, never. So if you feel like, okay, this might be the thing I've been looking for, you're right. All right. Let's talk Beyonce. So back in 2016, Harambe, the gorilla, had just been shot. You know, Trump was about to come in. Uh, it was kind of the beginning of the end for America. It all started with Harambe. I'm sorry, it did. Why would you shoot a gorilla? What kind of asshole even thinks of something like that? Anyway, so she performs her song Cuff It with the Dixie Chicks. This answered the question nobody asked. Nobody wanted to see this collaboration. <clears throat> so her song, Cuff It, is not a country song. It's like a funk kind of song. Here's how the song starts. I'm in the mood to fuck something up. Tonight I'm fucking something up, baby. This isn't what you sing at a country music award show. I'm sorry. This isn't, this isn't, this isn't it. This isn't it, okay? It's not a country song. I don't know who invited the Dixie Chicks to perform it with her. Like the whole thing was just the who's who of what? It was just very confusing. Now the Dixie Chicks heavily fell out of favor. I mean, they were blacklisted from country music. After September 11th, they just went on a tear against George W. Bush, which actually in hindsight was not incorrect. It was just, they just didn't read the room. You know, like it was not the time to shit on the president, even though he was and remains an idiot who started a war because Halliburton don't even get me fucking started. But they were like persona non grata and they've kind of like made a comeback. I just don't know why Beyonce was involved. And the Dixie Chicks said in an interview in 2020 that they were not treated very well. They said people were real weird to us backstage and the way people treated Beyonce was disgusting. I have some sources of my own, okay? And listen, I'm not saying that their account is completely wrong. I'm not saying that my friend's account is completely right. But what my friend said was, it's just that people weren't kissing their ass. That's what, it was. she was there. She's like, no one was mean. Like the, the war shows are hectic and people are running around. No one was mean or inappropriate, but just no one was like, ha oh. And the Dixie Chicks have, I mean, they've got, they got a, 
a bit of an attitude. I've heard that a lot about them in the industry that they've just, they're a little big for their britches. Um, and I, I think it would be reasonable to expect that Beyonce probably is too. And this was just not, again, like no one was reading the room. The Dixie Chicks are not really a thing anymore in country music. And I love them. And they were like, I think they really like brought so much feminism to country music. Like there weren't these massive girl groups before the Dixie Chicks. Like they were like a, just an explosion on the scene. Like they were amazing. Obviously same with Beyonce, but that was, first of all, for the Dixie Chicks, that's not true anymore. And with Beyonce, that is true, but this was not her audience. Like this was not her house. She, she was a guest there. She was a guest there. And she wasn't up for an award. She didn't have a song on country radio. So it's like, I mean, I'm sorry if people were like rude to her or made her feel out of place, but she was out of place. She's not a country artist. Would Jason Aldean have been welcomed with open arms into like the MTV Europe Music Awards or like Coachella or the Soul Train Awards or something? Like, no. If you're a Beyonce fan, do you even know who Jason Aldean is? Exactly. So. It's, it's, to me, it's like, it's a respect thing. I love a crossover, but I think people need to understand it's like, this is their world. Like if you show up to like a classical music awards, are there? I don't even know. And you're like, I'm Little Wayne. How much sort of clout is this man supposed to get? Like these aren't his people. He hasn't really earned entree into this group. I don't know. I So, that's my like, hmm, 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 umbrage with, with that, with her, with her feeling like that. However, I love revenge. My whole life is fueled by spite. I love it. And you know what? A lot of times the things that we are like punching back against maybe didn't happen the way we remember. The thing that I am forever like fighting, the ghosts that I'm always fighting is the concept, is the people telling me I couldn't do something. People chronically underestimating me as a child because I grew up in a very affluent place and we were doing great. I mean, you know, maybe <laughs> we were doing well, but it was, I mean, people had planes and we didn't have planes because I had a single mother and we worked very, very, very hard, very, very, very hard to create generational wealth. My whole family has. And I was still looked down on because there wasn't a dad around. And I remember parents, it was never the kids, it was never my peers who made me feel weird. It was the parents. They'd be like, where's your father? And the truth was, I didn't know, you know? And I was like seven, like, I don't know. I don't even know where my like socks go. Like they're like, I can't even keep track of like my roller skates. I don't know where my, I don't know. And so I felt like a second class citizen. And that was something I was going to prove was wrong. I was not going to be pregnant at 15 like I feel like people thought I was. I was, you know, not going to just circle the drain and like have some dumb job. I was going to be really successful. Look what I chase. I chase fame. Like, hello? The pathology is unmistakable. Even when I moved off to New York, people underestimated me. It was the one boss who's like, you're gonna think like a stone. And I look back and it's like the amount of fucking headspace I have given these losers is insane. I don't even remember their names. I don't remember the names of these people who have informed so much of my life and my pathology. It's crazy. And you know, I have this, this narrative that people were underestimating me. And the other day my mom was like, where are you getting that from? You were literally a straight A student. You were all, you won every single election that you ever entered. You were prom queen. Like who exactly was underestimating you? She's like, I just don't know where you're getting that from because you were a big bright shining star. And I was like, damn it, no. I needed to hold on to that hate, that revenge, to keep me fueled going forward. I have talked about this a lot in therapy. Every single therapist I have had is like, you can let it go. You can let it go, okay? Because you won. No one's gonna say that you haven't been successful. No one can say that you're lazy. You can like loosen your grip a little bit. And in my mind, no, I can't because then everything's gonna fall apart. You know, everything's gonna fall apart. This pathology 
of revenge, revenge, revenge can be pretty self-destructive. Who, who knew? Except for literally everyone who talks about revenge. And this is part of the reason I did Evil Week this past year, which is the Light and Dark Feminine Energy course, because I'm great at the dark feminine. A lot of us alpha females are. But when it comes to like relaxing and just being able to be soft and sweet and vulnerable and trusting, whoo, our fear is that, no, everything's going to fall apart. I can't do that. That's crazy. That's crazy. And so I kind of want to sit down with Beyonce and be like, on one hand, I get it. I get it. And like, who, who cares if your villain origin story is even true to some degree? Because listen, like my mom said, she's like, I don't know where you're getting this from. And I'm like, at this point, it doesn't matter. I need that villain origin story to keep me moving forward, to keep me from getting soft. And of course, like I said, a lot of people are like, no, you don't. You're, it's getting bizarre. Same with Beyonce, maybe. Like she said, this has been in the works for five years. That's a hell of a long time to hold a grudge. That's a really long time for something that, like my source said, and again, you know, grain of salt, I don't know, didn't happen that way. Or if it did, that was not the intention. You know, no one was like, there's a black person here. You know, I don't, she's like, that's not the case. That's just not the case. Uh, clearly it wasn't racist because the Dixie chicks were treated kind of the same way. So I, I don't know. I don't know. Who knows? Who knows what actually happened? But high five to Beyonce for holding the grudge. Good for her because perception is reality. If she felt that she was really wronged back then, the fact that she has taken that and turned it into, turned that, that hate into jet fuel. I love it. I love it. This is an inspiration. This is an inspiration. I say this because if you're thinking about switching lanes, I want you to cultivate a bit of a grudge. Not, to, don't take it to the Beyonce and Shallon level, you know, but a little bit of that. I want you to look at the people who are like, I wouldn't do that if I were you. <laughs> I know you wouldn't. You can't do what I do. Who asked you? I say this to people all the time. You can't do what I do. I wouldn't do that if I were you. I know that. I know that. That's why you're you and I get to be me. <laughs> Thanks. I want you to have that attitude against the naysayers. No, hold on. There's a difference between hate and feedback. There's a difference between hate and feedback. I was talking to my mom about this the other day. I don't even know what, how it was coming up. Oh, I, we were talking, I don't know. But you know the phrase like hustlers move in silence? My mom was kind of saying that. She's like, every big decision I've ever made in my life, I didn't ask anyone. Going to nursing school, buying an apartment building. This woman bought an apartment building, building in San Francisco when she was 23. One time I snorted Adderall in the bathroom of my job when I was 23. Anyway. <laughs> having a baby on her own. She's like, I didn't, I didn't want a lot of opinions because everyone is looking at things through their own lens. You know, they're not going to be there to pick up the pieces or to build me up. You know, th this, the consequences rest on my shoulders alone. So why should anyone else get a vote? And I'm like, that's true. But I do believe in the wisdom of the crowd. If you are getting the same consistent feedback from people, maybe it's worth examining. And you know, I think we were talking about this in the Shalantrage, we've talked about this. Because I saw this quote by Andrew Tate. I know, with, don't get me started, I know, okay? I don't like Andrew Tate. I don't think everything he says though is completely idiotic, like anyone on planet Earth, like anyone on planet Earth. A broken clock is still right twice a day. But he's, he's like, if I wouldn't switch lives with you, I don't give a fuck what you have to say about the way I live, you know? It was something along those lines. And listen, this is not, this is just the first place I heard it, but this is not exactly like the most novel concept in the world. I've seen it a million places on Instagram since then. But it, it that has some merit. It's like, if I don't wanna walk your path, I don't need your advice on walking mine. That's valid, but it's also valid that someone doesn't need to be in your shoes to maybe see that you're doing things wrong, that you're doing things wrong. That is different than someone just being a hater. And I think that's what Tate meant by it. Like, what do you guys think about Andrew Tate? Have you heard some things that he said and you're like, this is irrespective of the kidnapping thing. Just, I'm talking about what he said. Anyway, I think he was talking about like haters, 
you know, like boo, the booing from the cheap seats, not people who are actually close to you, who have an interest in your happiness, who are like, hey, maybe let's not drop out of med school with, you know, a semester left and open a flower shop in Spain. Maybe, maybe that's not, maybe just ride out the medical school, then figure out what you wanna do. Are you getting constructive feedback? Because this is what's difficult. My big advice to you is to ask for some feedback. I'm gonna, okay? This is our work as human beings, to find the intersection between feedback from the outside world and our own intuition. And this is why I always say like, we have to be good with being alone. We have to be good with being bored, ugh, heartbroken, ugh, sad. Like we have to allow ourselves to work through emotions, why? It's not just an exercise in masochism. It's so that we can learn to make our brain quiet enough that our intuition will be heard. I have learned that I am, <laughs> that my spleen talks to me. I'm like a splenic kind of person. Basically that means my intuition will whisper immediately once, once. She's not gonna beat me over the head with it. So I, and I learned this via, do you guys know what human design is? It's kind of like, I wouldn't say it's astrology, but if you like astrology, you'll like this. It's almost like, it's kind of like brain chemistry and brain wiring plus astrology. So you take your birth date and time and all of that, and it tells you kind of how you're wired. So I'm a projector. And so I'm, I'm a, like a splenic projector. I'm a non-specific manifester, which has been hugely, hugely helpful for me because I've, I used to like try to manifest by coming up with like a billion details of the scene. That's actually not how I manifest. I do it by focusing on the feelings I wanna feel and keeping the details vague to allow for things to unfold in ways that maybe I didn't even predict. I got this uh, this whole reading via one of my friends, Anna Lacomi. She's fantastic. I met her like here, like we met on a, on a Shalligator fan trip. She's the best. And she does these human design readings. She's usually booked out a, like pretty far, but she just opened up her schedule. She's like, I'm clearing things. I'm opening things up. She's gonna take time off, but she's like, no, I'm not going to. If you want a human design reading, this will really help you. I'll put her link right down below of her IG. Just like DM her but she will tell you how your intuition speaks to you because it's not just, it's not always that. There's some people they need to gather a lot of data. There's some people that have to wait a really long time and like think and think and think. Me, I'm more like immediate and the more I think kind of the worse things get. So that was really helpful for me. And if we can understand our intuition, human design reading or not, we will be able to accept or reject feedback. You know, we will be, and then, and we won't be like bitchy and punchy about it. People give me feedback all the time, all the time. Ideas about what I should do with my career, how I should take my brand and what I should do. And I have gotten good at being alone, being by myself, embracing the suck, and just trusting myself. And so therefore, when my strategist or, you know, somebody is like, hey, why don't you try this? You should make more on TikTok. I was like, I don't like TikTok. They're like, but it's good for your career. I'm like, I don't like it, so I'm not gonna do it. Like, that's that, that's that. Like, I, I understand why you're saying that and your logic isn't wrong, that's just not me. That's not what I feel like doing, I don't enjoy it. No, thank you, thank you so much. I'm actually just gonna delete that, you know? But whereas before, if someone would give me feedback and be like, no, rah, it would feel it would feel like someone was trying to box me in. And then I'd be like, they're just jealous. They're not jealous. They're maybe giving me some feedback that they view as very constructive and potentially helpful. And I learned where that intersection is. This is, this is life's work. This is a biggie. This is a biggie. But you know what? Here's where you can start. I don't want you to put things out on IG. Hey guys, I'm thinking about switching my career. I want you to ask the people who know you and who are not historically jealous of you. And maybe that's only one person. That's okay. Maybe it's two people. Great, that's fine. Maybe it's someone who doesn't know you ultra well. That might have its benefits as well, like a coworker. And you're like, hey, I'm kind of thinking about getting out of graphic design and like going into publishing. What do you think? They might have some feedback that you've never considered. If it's difficult for you to hear feedback, because I mean, I don't love it. I, I don't know, some people do, I really don't. Like I, I'm very like sensitive and I'm like, fuck you. Like I've said, I've worked on this, but I'm still like a sensitive little girl. I will prefer to take feedback in text form, like email or text, 
because I can digest it in bite-sized pieces. I can look at it more neutrally. I don't have to respond right away. You know, I'm not like emotional in the moment. I haven't had a few cocktails in me or whatever. You know, if you ask someone face to face across the table, plus people are more likely to be honest over like a little bit of a separated medium versus like looking at you in the whites of your eyes and being like, you would make a terrible Twitch streamer. Just in case you were curious, do not do this. So I think that that is maybe a way to kind of like ease in, like tiptoe into feedback if you're considering a really big change. What I also want you to do is get some actual feedback from people who have walked a mile in your shoes, people who have made changes similar to or exactly like the one you're trying to make. I cannot tell you, I cannot tell you how many people message me and I'm answering one-on-one -on -one questions on passes.com, you can click the link below, and they wanna become an influencer. And whether it's you guys, like people who watch this channel or people who I know in real life, their questions always boil down to the same question, which is, what's the secret? I mean, would you ask, like, Michael Phelps, what's the secret? He's like, a lot of work and repetition and, like, it's not like a one ingredient thing. It's not like a, oh, here's a code you enter at checkout. Like, it's, there's a lot that goes into something, you know, and I'm not not saying I'm as productive as Michael Phelps, but you know what I mean. It's like someone who's doing something totally different and there's like not a lot of people who do it. But the gist is they don't necessarily want the actual recipe, they want the secret ingredient, okay? That is not the recipe for success. You look at any successful person and you know, there's memes of this. You think the graph is just, it goes up, but instead it's like, it's up and down, it's up and down, it's back and forth, it's back and forth. Don't look at the result and assume how it was made. Don't look at the dish and think you can just guess the ingredients and the order and the, and the preparation. You probably can't. But if you are strong enough and if you really wanna make change happen, you will find someone who is five miles down the road to you and say, not what is the secret, but how did you get here? Can you tell me a little bit about your journey? Can you tell me things you think you did right, things you think you did wrong? Do not use the phrase, pick your brain. First of all, it's gross. I've just, the visual, I just hate that. Blech. Can I pick your brain? All I hear when someone says that to me is, can I cannibalize a lifetime of your experience, gobble it up and just walk out the door? I'm not saying that I'm not willing to let someone do that. It's just, they're not coming at me right. I want someone to come at me with a, a little bit of respect. I'd love to grab a coffee and pick your brain. How about you say, What's your favorite restaurant in town? Can I take you to lunch? I really wanna hear about your journey. I look up to you. I think you are such an inspiration. If you wouldn't mind sharing some of this information with me, I would just really be super grateful. That's the person I'm gonna go spend some time with. They're just coming a little correct. And that to me, the fact that they're taking the time to come correct means they're probably gonna listen. I have absolutely no interest in sitting down for a free fucking latte, I can buy them myself, thank you, and telling someone all about how I've done what I've done for them to be like, mm-hmm, yeah, so would you say you like bought a bunch of Lightroom presets or like, like what's the secret? If you aren't serious, miss me, okay? I'm willing to help people who are serious about changing their life in whatever way that is. Maybe it's career, maybe it's fitness, maybe it's dating, whatever. Don't bullshit me and don't waste my time and I can spot that person from a mile away, a mile away. And almost all successful people can, almost all. You know, and it's extremely insulting. It's extremely insulting. But I'm gonna like flatter them and tell them they're cool. They know they're cool. <laughs> they know they're, they don't need you to tell them, okay? Make it worth their while. If you have something to offer them, hey, I would love to redo uh, your homepage for you. I'm a coder, you know? And if you wouldn't mind, you know, I would never want you to pay me. If you wouldn't mind just telling me a little bit about how you got to the top of the publishing industry, I think that would be like really helpful for me because I'd love to break into that. What can you offer someone else? What can you offer someone else? Even if you don't think you have anything to offer, a willingness is is something. Like I had someone one time, she was in, I think she was a senior in high school and she wanted to like get into like influencing and whatever. And she's like, I literally have nothing to offer you, um, but I know you're so busy. So if I would love to pick your dog up from daycare for a week, if you wouldn't mind sitting down with me for coffee. And I was like, 
That's so nice of you, thank you. It was so thoughtful and it was so, it was respectful of my time. And she was cognizant enough to be like, what could I take off this woman's plate? What's a pain point for her that I could help solve? From a psychological standpoint, we are much more obligated to people who give us gifts. This is, this is a psychological truth. So if you can like press on that, we talked about this in the Chalantrage, um, I talked about bribery. I bribe people all the time because of exactly that. Like people, you ingratiate yourself to people when you're giving them something or you're offering to do something for them. You know, gifts are very useful and very helpful. So employ that and really listen to what they have to say. Bring a notebook. That's also gonna demonstrate that you're serious. Do some research, okay? Literally ask Chad GPT, what does it take to become an electrical engineer? What does it take to open a flower sh store in Spain? I don't know. Do I need extra qualifications? Set yourself up for success. Data is the key to success. Data is it. And then ask yourself, how can I create some small routines? Because this is what I, this is what I see a lot when people wanna switch lanes. They get piggy big eyes. They get fevered, fevered with this new thing that they wanna do. <gasps> ha, I wanna go get my PhD, yay! I wanna be an influencer, ha! And they wanna just go scorched earth. I'm gonna walk out of my job. I'm gonna pull the plug of this. I'm gonna leave my, my husband. I'm gonna cut off all my hair. Don't cut off your hair. Enthusiasm is amazing. It is not a substitute for a plan. It only works in tandem with a plan. These two, they are Siamese twins, baby. You gotta think of enthusiasm and preparation as one and the same because Successful people will tell you that their enthusiasm is usually rooted in a plan. They don't feel very good at all. They don't feel enthusiastic at all if they don't have a plan. They feel scattered, anxious, directionless, like they're wasting time. And all of those are correct responses to not having a plan. They should feel like that. It's true. I love when a plan comes together. That's when I'm like, oh, fuck yeah, yes. We booked this room. We've outlined the course. I've got the photographer set up. I've got the hair and makeup. Boom, we're doing it, we're doing it. So now, because I have a plan, I can put other things on the back burner because I'm like, no, I have to focus on this because I've spent a lot of time setting it up. Joel Osteen, I've talked about this before. If you're at the London meetup, you know what I'm gonna bring up. Joel Osteen has a podcast, I think it's, oh, it's called Faith in the Middle. That's what it's called, Faith in the Middle. Listen to it, whether you're religious or not, it doesn't matter. But it's about how to stay faithful and determined and resolute when you're in the middle of pursuing a goal. And he brings up a good point. Everyone's psyched, he didn't use that term, everyone's psyched when they set a goal. It's exciting, you know? I'm gonna run a marathon! And of course you're thrilled when you, when you do it, when you cross that finish line. It's the middle, okay? When the alarm's going off, when you have to say no, when you can't go buy that thing, when you come home from your job and you gotta get full hair and makeup so you can sit down and do your YouTube videos because you're trying to become an influencer and leave that corporate job. I know, I've done it. That's when in the quiet moments. <sighs> so this is another tip. Prepare yourself for the middle. Understand that this is coming. But also keep sight of why you are chasing this thing. Keep sight of why you wanna do this. If it's just like, I am fucking tired, but if this thing arrived to me tomorrow, I would still be really excited. And for some people, that's not the case. It's like, you know what? I've gone through a year of law school. I don't wanna be a lawyer. I don't like this. Okay, that's very valid. And at that point, yeah, maybe you shouldn't stick it out. But if you're like, no, I really, oh, I'm just picturing myself crossing that finish line, then you just have to do the fucking work. You just have to do the work. And this is why I kind of caution against telling a bunch of people what your plans are. And this is why I do back up what my mom says and the whole phrase of hustlers move in silence because you don't wanna front load those congratulations. Psychologically, people who do that and get applause on the front end when they announce that they wanna write a book, they haven't written it, they don't have a book deal, they're just, I'm gonna write a book, I'm gonna go back to school. The attention that they get from this actually de-incentivizes them to move forward and get it done. Because they've like, Eating dessert first, you know what I mean? The next big thing I'm gonna tell you is grit and patience, grit and patience. Like I said, we all get piggy big eyes. And it's like, fuck it, I'm just gonna quit my job. Let me tell you, 
Whatever it is you're excited about, whatever it is you're gonna leave your job to do, you will hate within three weeks. You will hate it. You will be so incredibly resentful. You will be scared to goddamn death because you don't have any money coming in. And this thing that you really love to do is now the thing that has to work, but not in a good way, in a way that's desperate. So maybe networking that you wanna do, whereas before when you had a job, you had a paycheck coming in, now that networking has a very desperate edge. And desperation is the strongest smell in the world. You don't wanna do this. You wanna wait, you wanna have a plan, you wanna be strategic. Work, 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 work on this side hustle until the tipping point occurs. And if you work and if you are strategic and if you are faithful in the middle, it will occur. That, that tipping point 100% will occur. Then you can leave that job and you can ride out of there with your head high and be like, fuck yes. I did this the right way. I am so proud of myself. The way you did it will be just as like bolstering, just as much of a feather in your cap as the thing that you've done. It 100% will because you're going to march into this new phase, this new lane, knowing that you have what it takes to create routines, grit, determination, resolve, follow through. So that even if people are like, wait, you're really leaving your job to be a YouTuber? You can be like, yeah, because I've actually been a YouTuber this whole time. I come home from my job and I clock in to YouTube and I work my ass off until 10 p.m. And so I know the systems are in place. And I know that you think you're only looking at the end result. You're looking at the finish line. You're not looking when the alarm goes off and I'm hitting the track. And that's okay. People don't need to be there with you during the sticky middle. Again, think of the dish and the ingredients. The metaphors are all over today. I'm sorry. They, they don't need to see how it's made. They don't, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter because they're not going to be there making it with you. You know how it's made and you can look yourself in the eye and you can look them in the eye and you can say, I've actually got this. I know what I'm doing. I have systems in place. I've proven to myself that I can learn these things. I can be resilient. I had a plan that when I made X amount of money, that was the tipping point. I could leave behind this job and I could move forward. Is it a leap? Yes. Anything worth doing is. But what if you skew to the opposite direction? What if you aren't someone who leaps before they look? You just look and look and you keep looking and there's looking more and you just ruminate and you actually never make a switch. You never just pull the trigger. <sighs> Ask yourself why. Are you not pulling the trigger because there is a strategy in place or there's not and you're not even at the point where you've made a strategy? Are you not pulling the trigger because you don't have the data about what it would look like to go back to school? Fucking go get it. Go get it. Google it. Ask ChatGPT for God's sakes. Go find that mentor. Because you know what? Maybe you're right. Maybe it isn't for you. Maybe people are like, I don't think you're going to want to go back to school for this. Maybe they're 100% correct. And it's okay if people end up being right. Truly, I mean, it is such a life skill. It is such a like ultra elite level of behaving to be able to say to someone, you told me so, you were right. My mom is incredible at it. Like it, she has zero ego. She's, she's the first one to admit when she's wrong. I don't know how she raised me. Oof, did not turn out that way. Poor, poor woman. But it really is inspirational because she will course correct midstream. She's like, oh, I was so wrong. You guys are right. Let's course correct. And that's really an admirable thing. And that's probably why she was able to buy an apartment building in 23. Could have something to do with that. <clears throat> anyway. Find out, really ask yourself, why am I not pulling the trigger? Is it your intuition that's like, this is wrong for us? Is it not that? Is it the opposite? Your intuition, we love her. Who do we not love? Crystal, Crystal, who's just the fear brain, who's going to hiss all of these things in your ear. You're going to fall flat on your face. Everyone's going to make fun of you. Everyone's going to be screaming, we told you so. Okay, okay. All right, let's break some of those things down. You're gonna fall on your face. What is the fallout for that? I mean, is it like really bad? You're like, no, I'll, I could end up homeless. Okay, that's valid. Don't do that. Don't make a move if that could be a potential outcome, you know, depending. I mean, it's, it's a potential outcome for all of us by the grace of God. But what are the steps you can take to insulate yourself from that? Is it more schooling? Is it 
doing that transition, like waiting till the tipping point occurs from your job, like you, you can put some barriers in place to keep you from falling quite that far. Pay off your debt, get a little savings going. If that means you pick up extra shifts, so be it. So that can be defeated. That crystal argument can be defeated with logic and behavior. What if it's everyone's gonna laugh at you? Okay. Who's everyone? Well, everyone. No, literally who? Who is it? Do you even know who they are? Because remember at the beginning of this video, I was like, oh, I'm getting back against these people. Which people? Can you name them? Do you interact with them? Do they even know if you're dead or alive? I mean, not... <laughs> who are the people? And you're like, my mom. My mom and my sister would laugh at me. Okay, with respect, fuck them. Fuck what they say. What are they trying to do? No one who is also daring greatly would ever laugh at someone else who is. No one. They might be like, I don't know that I'd advise that, but they are not going to pull up and be like, ah! they're not going to. The things that people make fun of you for, I mean, are usually the things that are missing within them. The things that they hate you for. And listen, if they're going to be like, me tell you something, they're probably bitter and pissy that you dared to dare because they know that they can't. So all they can do is just boo from the cheap seats. You know, the loudest boos come from the cheapest seats. The people who are doing something with their life who are in the front row, they would never. Because they're in the trenches too. They get it. They get how hard it is to take a risk, to branch out, to move, to make new friends, to ch change your job. They're not going to be throwing any stones. That's who you have to focus on. But you know, the boos are always going to be loud. And they're like, yeah, you got this. That's going to be more subtle, which is again, why we have to find this within ourselves as much as we possibly can. So, okay, we've defeated that monster. People are gonna laugh at me. Like, get comfortable with the fact that people might. People might laugh at you, girl, even if you do it. That's not a guarantee. If you're living your life for the applause, for the approval, the gold star, yikes. I know because I did for, you know, a time in my life in various categories, but never with my career, not ever. It always belonged to me. And people laughed when I failed, people laughed when I made it. Oh, you think you're somebody. No, no, I don't think it. I know it. I know it. And you know what? The fact that you're so pressed about my success means you know it too. If I was an actual nobody, this wouldn't bother you a bit. You wouldn't even notice. But I'm so triggering to you for a reason. I'm powerful. And that's how you have to see it. You're not gonna get 100% of the people to be happy for you and to pat you on the back 100% of the time. With respect, why do you need that? Why do you need that? Ask yourself that. This is something, this is your homework. Sit with that and be like, why, why do I need this? And who do I really, 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 really need it from? I'm not telling you to like try to slay the dragon of needing your parents' approval. I need my mom's approval. You know the Tide Pods example. She's like, don't use those. I was like, okay. Yes, ma'am, I'm not, I'm not going to. But then for some reason, when it comes to my career, I was like, I know what I'm doing. But she's always been very supportive, so chicken and the egg. I'm not telling you that you should try to become this island and you don't need anyone and you're the Unabomber living in a hermit cabin or something, but try to give yourself the accolades you need. Or if, if that is a bridge too far, I get it, I really do get it. At least decentralize how important these other opinions are, you know? Because you gotta live with yourself 24 seven, girl. You better like where you're at. You better really approve of yourself. Because you know, when you approve, the storms and the challenges, they really are easier to weather. Cause it's like, you know what? Hey, this didn't work out. It didn't sell. I got an F, whatever. At least I tried. Do you know that the number one thing people regret on their deathbed is that they didn't go for their dreams? How sad is that? And we picture our deathbed when we're 90. Maybe it isn't. Maybe it isn't, man. God hope, I hope it is. But maybe it's not. What if it was five years from now? What if you're in the hospital right now? And you're like, I really wish I would have taken some more chances. I and mean, you're gonna get out of the hospital. This is just a temporary thing. But has that not crossed your mind? Don't ever give your life the opportunity to tell you that again. Don't ever let, never, never. You hear that one time in your life from your brain, I wish I would have gone for something. Never 
let that happen again, ever. Learn from it, harness that. You don't have a grudge to nurse, that's your grudge. That's your grudge right there. It's a grudge against yourself. I am never living a life so that I sit here and think, why didn't I go for that dream I really wanted? Why didn't I live authentically? Because I was afraid of what people would say. Well, did I ever stop to consider what I would say? How it's out with me? Because here it is sitting with me and I hate it. I hate it. So good for you, Beyonce. If this was some dream she had in her heart, okay. I'm sure her album's going to be great. She's from Texas. She's from Texas. She's got that drawl. She's got a nice voice. I can't wait to listen to it. You know, I haven't liked her last few albums. I hated Lemonade. God, I hated that album. It's just, I, I just didn't, it wasn't my cup of tea, you know? So I'm psyched for this, psyched for it. What do you guys think? If you have radically switched lanes, what are some tips that you can pass on? These were mine, what are yours? And listen, if you are like, I don't have anyone who's supportive of what I'm trying to do, come to the Chalantrage, we got you, we got you. It's girls from all over the world. I mean, every walk of life, every career, every path, every religion, every race, every family situation, like, you, you will find people who are like, I have been through the exact same thing. There's 700 of us, there's a lot. So you're gonna find some girls, and even if not, everyone's gonna embrace you and be like, you've got this, you've got this. Or here's maybe some feedback, and it's all neutral. It's like no one knows you, so no one's like jealous and weird. You know, they're like, ugh, Catherine, you can't do that. They're like, I don't know, of course she can. Why wouldn't she be able to? So it's all the support without any of the judgment. It's fantastic. I love it. And it's, yeah, it's just wonderful. Link is down in the bio. All right, tell me what you think. Um, like I said, have you switched lanes? How did it go? Did you switch back? And you know, even when I have taken a big chance, like, um, you know what, like living here in Montana, I have been, if you're in the Chalantrage, you know, I've been kind of going through it, thinking about like how, I don't know. Is this my forever home? I will never regret moving here though. This was in my heart. It felt right. No one else understood it. And I didn't need them to because no one else was gonna move with me. No one else was gonna endure life in New York City with me. You know, I was in my apartment by myself. So it's like, I needed to make myself happy. And even if I'm like, you know what? I'm sick of it here, which I'm not. But even if I get to that point, it will never be like, oh, cringe decision. No, it was a completely authentic decision. I just changed my mind. And you're allowed to do that. You are allowed to reinvent yourself as many times as you feel like it. And you're allowed to just try on new personalities. Because remember, that's feminism. And that's what we do around here. All right, we'll see you later, Shalligators.